Do you ever find yourself restless, feeling like you're missing something fundamental in life? This feeling can drive us down paths of exploration, new hobbies, self-help books, or even seeking a spiritual guru. Philosopher Alan Watts offers a fascinating perspective on this search, particularly the role of gurus and our own inner journey. Watts explains that the trials gurus often put their students through are designed to instill a sense that we cannot achieve enlightenment through action alone. While a bit counterintuitive, this idea can be liberating. It suggests that our constant striving may actually be distracting us from what's already present within. The feeling that we lack something is common, yet Watts and many spiritual traditions suggest we're already whole, like the Buddhist concept of being Buddhas from the start. So if we can't do anything to find enlightenment, what's the point? Watts proposes that the very realisation of this futility is a profound step towards understanding. It means letting go of the frantic search and embracing the present moment, life happening right now, with you at the centre of it. So all these trials that gurus put their students through have as their ultimate object convincing you that you can't do anything. Only it's convincing you very thoroughly. It's convincing you in more than a theoretical way. Now, perhaps I shouldn't tell you that, but you see, I'm not a guru in that I don't give individual spiritual direction to people. And I give away the guru's tricks. That may not be very good, but on the other hand, those tricks are only necessary in the sense that I would say to someone, it's necessary for you to go to a psychiatrist if you think you must. And if you are not going to be satisfied without going to Japan and studying Zen Buddhism from a Roshi, okay, you better go. It isn't necessary unless you say it is. If that's the only thing that will satisfy you and you feel that deep down inside you. If you've got that yen, therefore you've got that yen. But if on the other hand you haven't, you haven't. And I'm not going to put you down on that account, you see. The point is, what do you want to do? What is it in you to do? But there it is, that you can struggle and struggle and struggle, and indeed will do so, as long as you have the feeling inside you that you're missing something. And people, your friends, all sorts of people will do their utmost to persuade you that you're missing something. Because they're missing something, and they think they're getting it through a certain way. And therefore, to assure themselves, they'd like you to do it too. So there's this thing. And you see, a clever guru beguiles his students by letting them have the feeling of success and accomplishment in certain directions. A guru gives people exercises, A, that are difficult but can be accomplished, and B, that are impossible. You'll always be hung up on the impossible ones, but the possible ones, you will feel, get a feeling of making progress so that you will double your efforts to solve the impossible exercises. And then they range things in many, many ranks and levels through which you can advance. This stage of consciousness, that state of consciousness, or think of the degrees of masonry, or so on. Ranks in learning things, the different belts you get in judo and all that kind of jazz. You can do that. And it gives people the sense of competing with themselves or even with others because of the feeling inside that there is just something I'm missing. And of course, if you are learning any sort of skill and you haven't perfected the skill, there is indeed something you're missing. But in this thing that we're talking about, that isn't true because you, as the Buddhists say, are Buddhas from the very beginning and all that Searching is like looking for your own head, which you can't see and therefore might conceivably imagine that you're lost. So that indeed is the point, that we don't see what looks and therefore we think we've lost it. And so we're in search of the self, the Atman. Well, that's the one thing we can't find <laughs> because we have it. We are it. <laughs> but we confuse it with all these images. So therefore, if you understand perfectly clearly that you can't do anything to find that very, very important thing, God, enlightenment, nirvana, whatever, then what? Well, I find, you know, 
it's so stupid because even if I tell myself, well, there's nothing I can do about it. Why did I say that? You see? Why did I say that? Why did I go out of my way to tell myself there's nothing I can do about it? Because in the back of my mind there was a funny little feeling that if I did tell myself that, something different would happen. See? All right. So even that doesn't work. Nothing works. Now when absolutely nothing works, where are you? Well, here we are. I mean, you, there's this feeling of something going on. Now the world doesn't stop dead when there's nothing you can do. Here's something happening. Now just there, that's what I'm talking about. There's the happening. When you are not doing anything about it, you're not not doing anything about it, you just can't help it. It goes on despite anything you think or worry about or whatever. Now, there is the point. Right there. And remember, although you will think at first that this is a kind of determinism, there are two reasons why it isn't. One, there is nobody being determined. Now, other people think of determinism as the direction of what happens by the past, the causation of what happens by the past. Now, if you will use your senses, you will see that that is a hallucination. The present does not come from the past. If you listen, and only listen, close your eyes, where do the sounds come from, according to your ears? You hear them coming out of silence. The sounds come, and then they fade off. They go like echoes or echoes in the labyrinths of your brain, which we call memories. But the sounds don't come from the past. They come out of now and trail off. You can do that later with your eyes. You can see, like when you're watching television, there's a vibration coming out from the screen to your eyes. And it starts from there somehow. Because we see the hands and then they move, we think that the movement is caused by the hands and that the hands were there before and so can move later. We don't see that our memory of the hands is an echo of their always being now. They never were. They never will be. They're always now. So is the motion. And that that is recollected is the trailing off echo like the wake of a ship. And so just as the wake doesn't move the ship, the past does not move the present unless you insist that it does. And if you say, well, naturally, I'm always moved by the past, that's an alibi. And it completely fails to explain how you ever learn anything new. <laughs> that's why all the psychologists who are mostly behaviorists are completely bogged down in trying to find a theory of learning. Because according to the, the theory of learning that we have, everything that new that you assimilate is really only learned when translated into terms of what you already know. So in that sense learning becomes like a library which increases only by the addition of books about books already in it. <laughs> a lot of libraries are indeed like that. So that's what we call scholasticism. So then you become aware that this happening isn't happening to you because you are the happening. The only you there is, is what's going on. Yeah, feel it. And disregard these stupid distinctions that you've been taught. I mean, stupid, relatively speaking. And feel it genuinely. When you feel it genuinely, you get down to rock bottom, all that isn't there. That's a game that's been erected on it. And it isn't determined. In other words, you get this odd feeling of a synthesis between doing and happening in which doing is as much happening as happening, and happening is as much doing as doing. And if you are not very careful at that point, you'll proclaim yourself God Almighty in the Hebrew Christian sense. <laughs> like Freud alleges babies feel that they're omnipotent, and in a way they are. I am omnipotent insofar as I'm the universe, but I'm not omnipotent in the role of Alan Watts. <laughs>